Today we're going to be talking about how to find the volume of a solid using cylindrical coordinates. And in this particular problem, we've been given a solid, E, and we've been told that E is a solid that lies inside a cylinder. The equation of the cylinder is x squared plus y squared plus 1. So if you can picture a cylinder, so far we have the solid lying inside that cylinder. Above the plane, z equals 0. So if z equals 0 cuts off the bottom of that cylinder, then it's everything inside the cylinder and above that line, that plane. And also below the cone, z squared equals 4x squared plus y squared. So if you imagine a cone that cuts off the top of the cylinder, then we're saying the solid E is everything within the bounds of those three equations. So first of all, before we find the volume in cylindrical coordinates, we're going to need to get a triple integral in cylindrical coordinates. Right now we have the triple integral of x squared dv, meaning the volume here. We're going to need to turn this into an iterated integral, which is in terms of r, theta, and z. If you remember, we have Cartesian coordinates x, y, z. When we convert those to cylindrical coordinates, they become r, theta, z, which is really similar to polar coordinates, except we've added a third dimension, z, which doesn't change across these two coordinate systems. So the way that we're going to attack this problem is first by converting the three functions that we've been given into cylindrical coordinates from Cartesian coordinates. So for example, we've been told that the solid lies within the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 1. Well, we have these three formulas that convert Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates for us. We know that r squared equals x squared plus y squared, so we can just substitute r squared for this x squared plus y squared here. And now our cylinder, if we just write this here, we're going to get r squared is equal to 1. If we take the square root of both sides, we see that r equals 1. The reason we don't include positive negative 1 is because we're talking about a physical volume, a three-dimensional object with a real radius. If we had a radius of negative 1, that object wouldn't exist. It wouldn't be a real solid. So we only have to say r equals positive 1. So the equation of our cylinder in cylindrical coordinates is just r equals 1. What about the plane z equals 0? We have our plane here z equals 0. Well, we already said that the coordinate z doesn't change across Cartesian and cylindrical coordinate systems. It stays the same. Notice we've got z here and we've got z here. It doesn't change at all. So we can just leave this in this form. The equation of our plane is still going to be z equals 0. But now what about our cone? Well, we have z squared equals 4x squared plus 4y squared. If we change that to z squared equals, let's factor out a 4 from that. We pull out a 4 and we get 4 times quantity x squared plus y squared. Now for x squared plus y squared, we can substitute this r squared here and we get z squared equals 4r squared. Taking the square root of both sides to solve for z, we get z equals 2r because the square root of 4 is 2, the square root of r squared is r. And again, the reason we don't include positive and negative 2r is because we're dealing with this physical three-dimensional object here. So we have z equals 2r. Now, if we try to come up with limits of integration for r, theta, and z, let's go ahead and write those out. We'll have r, theta, and z. We know that our solid lies above the plane z equals 0. It's also going to be below the cone, which is defined by z equals 2r. That means our limits of integration for z are going to be 0 to 2r. Remember, z is our vertical dimension, and we're saying above 0 and below 2r. So those are our limits of integration for z. For theta, when we're dealing with a cylindrical coordinate system, Theta is always defined from 0 to 2 pi. Remember when we had a polar coordinate system with our you know, polar coordinate system like this, we started at the angle 0 for theta. We go around the polar coordinate system until we get back here, which is at theta equals 2 pi. We go all the way from 0 to 2 pi. That's our domain, if you will, for theta. So our limits of integration for theta are going to be 0 to 2 pi. Now what about for r? We have r equals 1, but what's our other limit of integration for r? Well, we've got this three-dimensional cylinder, which is centered right at the origin. If we picture a cylinder around the origin like this, and it looks like this, and this is obviously a really rough sketch, but if we have this cylinder right here, 
the very center of our cylinder, right, is at zero and it goes out to a distance of one. So, because the radius is one, it goes out to a distance of one and no matter which direction you go from the center to one, the minimum value for R is gonna be zero. R at the origin is zero. Out to the edge of the cylinder is gonna be one. So our limits of integration for R are gonna be zero to one like this. Now when we're dealing with cylindrical coordinates, our standard order of integration is gonna be z, then r, then theta. Because theta's limits of integration are always gonna be the same here, zero to two pi, and because z usually involves one of the other variables here, r or theta. So what we're gonna do is set up our triple integral like this. We're gonna say dz dr d theta. Because we have dz on the inside, our innermost integral is gonna hold our limits of integration for z, so we have zero to two r. Then the middle variable here, r, we need to look at the middle integral here. Our limits of integration for r are zero to one, so we put those there. And then theta is last, so our outermost integral here is for theta, we have zero to two pi. So notice now we've got our limits of integration, we've got our order of integration. What about the function that we're integrating? Well, we've been given here x squared. We just need to convert that to cylindrical coordinates. If we square both sides of this conversion formula here, we get x squared equals r squared cosine squared theta. So we need to put in r squared cosine squared theta. However, this is a really important point. Whenever you convert from Cartesian coordinates to cylindrical coordinates, it's important that you multiply by r. You multiply this result here by r, you add an additional r into your integral because the conversion isn't completely direct. So instead of just r squared cosine squared theta, which would be our direct substitution, we multiply by an additional r and we get r cubed cosine squared theta. That's the function that we're gonna be integrating. Now we've got our integral set up, we just need to evaluate it. So because we have dz on the inside here, we're gonna be integrating first with respect to z. When we do that, we hold r and theta as constants, so this whole thing here is just a constant. When we integrate with respect to z, we just add a z to it. So we're gonna get the integral from zero to two pi, the integral from zero to one, and now we're gonna end up with r cubed, and let's put it in the middle here, z cosine squared theta. We're going to be evaluating that on the interval z equals 0 to z equals 2r, and we'll leave dr and d theta out here for later. Plugging in our upper limit of integration, we're going to substitute 2r for z, and what we're left with is 2r times r cubed, which is going to give us 2r to the fourth cosine squared theta. Then we're gonna subtract whatever we get when we plug in z equals zero. Well, when we plug in z equals zero, this whole term's just gonna become zero, so that's gonna disappear completely. We just have then our dr and d theta. As you can see from our order of integration here, r is next. We're gonna be evaluating the integral with respect to r, so we'll leave here zero to two pi. Integrating with respect to r, we're gonna get r to the fifth, then we need to divide by five, so we're gonna get two fifths r to the fifth cosine squared theta. Evaluating that on the interval, r equals zero to r equals one, and leaving our d theta for later. Now we plug in our upper limit of integration, r equals one. We're gonna get the integral from zero to two pi. One to the fifth is just one, so we're gonna get two fifths cosine squared of theta. Then we're gonna subtract whatever you get when we plug in zero. But when we plug in zero, this term will just become zero. There's no need to write a minus zero here. So we're just left then with d theta like this. Now we integrate with respect to theta. But before we can do that, we need to use our half angle formula to convert this cosine squared of theta to a lesser degree trigonometric function. So what we have here, notice, cosine squared of just some value a, and in our case that's theta, is equal to one half times one plus cosine of two a. So we're gonna use this formula and we're just gonna pretend that a is theta. So our integral becomes zero to two pi of two fifths, and then here we're substituting for cosine squared of theta. That's gonna be one half times one plus cosine of two 
times a, where a was theta for us, so we're just gonna get cosine of two theta, and then d theta. Now that we've reduced the value, let's go ahead and simplify a little bit here. We're gonna get the two in the numerator and denominator to cancel, so we're left with the integral from zero to two pi of one fifth times one plus cosine of two theta, like this, d theta, if we pull the one-fifth out in front so that it is outside of the integral, we'll get one-fifth times the integral from zero to two pi of one plus cosine of two theta d theta. Now it's really easy for us to integrate. We'll get one-fifth times the integral of one with respect to theta is just theta. The integral of cosine of two theta is going to be sine of two theta. Here's where we use chain rule. The integral of cosine is sine, so we integrate the cosine part, the outside function, leaving the inside function, two theta, alone. But now we need to divide by the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of two theta is two, so we need to divide by two, so we just put this one half out in front here. That's our integral. We need to evaluate this on the interval theta equals zero to theta equals two pi. Plugging in our upper limit of integration, two pi, we'll get one fifth times two pi plus sine of two times two pi is sine of four pi. That's gonna be the same angle as sine of two pi. We know that sine of two pi is just zero, so we're gonna get zero here. Then we're gonna subtract whatever we get when we plug in zero. Well, plugging in zero for theta here, we get zero. Sine of two times zero, or sine of zero, is still just zero, so we'll get plus zero like this. As you can see, all this goes away, and we're just left with one-fifth times two pi, which is, of course, gonna give us two pi over five as our final answer. This is the volume of the solid defined as E, which is bounded by these three functions, evaluated in cylindrical coordinates.